Radioactive decay is fundamentally a probabilistic process. Nothing in the environment can affect the decay of an unstable nucleus. This is very unlike all the other properties of things we know. In chemistry, you can drastically affect the rate at which a chemical reaction occurs, or even whether the chemical reaction will or won't occur if you change the environment. If you add a magnetic field, if you surround it with other atoms, if you change the temperature, if you change the chemical composition of the surrounding medium, all these things affect the way chemical processes go. Not so for nuclear processes. There is no way you can alter radioactive decay. This is tremendously advantageous if we want to use these radioactive nuclei as imperturbable clocks. However, there's an inconvenience that comes along with this, and that is you can never predict when a given radioactive decay will occur. It's very much like flipping a coin. So, for example, if you have a radioactive nucleus sitting on your desk and you think it's going to decay, head says it decays, tail says it's not, it's tails. It doesn't decay. You can then flip again after waiting a little while, and lo and behold, it's tails again. So it still doesn't decay. And you can flip it a third time, and finally, aha, it's heads, and the atom decays. Just because I got two tails the first time, however, does not mean that it was more likely that I get heads the next time. This is called the gambler's fallacy. It's if you get five heads in a row, if you get 15 heads in a row, it is still not more likely that the next flip will be tails. Every flip is independent. And there is exactly a 50-50 chance that after 15 heads in a row, you will flip a tails. Likewise, for a radioactive nucleus, it can sit there for a very long time before it decays, and then suddenly it will do so unaffected by the outside world, and unpredictable from physics that we know. This is one of the aspects of physics on the subatomic scale, which disturbed Einstein greatly. His famous quote on this subject was that God does not throw dice. He could not believe that there wasn't some underlying mechanism which would, if we understood it, allow us to predict when a particular nucleus would decay. That was 80 years ago. We still haven't found it. As far as we can tell, nature is fundamentally probabilistic at this very low level. However, that doesn't mean that we can't say anything about when this particular radioactive nucleus will decay. In fact, every single radioactive isotope has a very precisely defined quantity termed its half-life, which tells us, equivalently, either one, what the odds are that this particular nucleus will decay when it has a 50-50 chance of having decayed, or alternatively, and perhaps easy to picture, if we have a large quantity of these radioactive nuclei, all the same, when 50% of them will have decayed. The half-life should be thought of as when half of the substance in question has decayed. Now nuclei individually have no memories, so they don't know when you start counting the half-life. Thus, radioactive decay has a characteristic curve called an exponential, which behaves as follows. Let's say I start with a thousand nuclei, and the half-life is one minute. After one minute, the odds are I'll have 500 left. It may be 503, it may be 493, but I'll have roughly 500 left. But those 500 nuclei won't all disappear in the next half-life, because they don't know when I started counting. Those 500 they have a 50% chance of decaying in one minute. So, after the next minute, after two minutes, there won't be zero left, there'll be 250 left. Half of the 500 at the beginning of the second minute. And after the third minute, there'll be 125 left. That is, I go from the 100% of the substance to 50%, to 25%, to 12.5%, to 6.25%, steadily downward, getting ever closer, not reaching it for a very long time.
the number of particles left at any given moment is equal to the number you start with times one half raised to the power the time which you've gone by divided by this half-life. And the half-life is unique for every different isotope. Of a second for atoms that we rarely see, two tens of billions of years, longer than the age of the universe, for some of the heavy isotopes. Now, as a consequence of the unique and immutable half lives, radioactive isotopes can be used as clocks. In some cases, for example, radioactive parent nuclei produce stable daughter nuclei. This is often, but not always, the case. Therefore, suppose I have a rock that got melted in the interior of the Earth and shot out of a volcano at some time in the distant past. This rock contains lots of different kinds of atoms in the mix of minerals that make it up. And in particular, it's likely to contain radioactive nuclei. If those radioactive nuclei trapped in the crystalline structure of the rock now undergo decay, producing either alpha particles or electrons or positrons or gamma rays, the decay product is stuck there in the rock. It might be the wrong kind of element to fit in that place in the crystal lattice of the rock because the rock was formed with this other kind of element, two or one removed in the periodic table. But the daughter is stuck there. As time goes by, these radioactive nuclei continue to decay. And so much time may go by, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years, until there are no parent nuclei left anymore. But the daughters are still all trapped. If I come across this rock as a geologist and I want to determine how old it is, that is, when it was last in a magma state and thrown out of a volcano, all I have to do is daughter nuclei. Those daughter nuclei may, for example, be a noble gas, a gas that doesn't interact chemically in any way and therefore doesn't belong in a crystal at all. But if I smash the rock and I boil out this noble gas and count the number of atoms, I can say how many of the parent nuclei there were and if there are still any parent nuclei left, by taking the ratio of the number of daughters to the number of parents left, I can measure the age of the rock. Some daughter nuclei only arise from a specific kind of parent. So even if the parent is all gone, I can count up the number of daughter nuclei and know the original abundance of the parent. This, it turns out, is critically important in determining the age of the Earth and the meteorites which formed the solar system. For things that were once alive, the radioactive isotope of carbon, carbon-14, with six protons and eight neutrons, is an invaluable dating tool. Carbon-14, somewhat unusually, has a half-life really appropriate for human history. It's 5,730 years. So after 5,730 years, half of a sample of carbon-14 will have decayed into nitrogen-14, a stable nucleus. Carbon-14 if it was only produced in the beginning of the universe or in the stars that created the material out of which the sun uh, was born four and a half billion years ago, would be all gone because its half-life is 5,000 years and after five billion years there'd be none left at all. However, carbon-14 is constantly being produced in the atmosphere by cosmic rays which strike nitrogen atoms and turn them spontaneously into carbon-14. Cosmic rays are the extremely high energy particles that are produced in the remnants of exploded stars, such stars will be uh, visited by us in this lecture series, and they contain so much energy that they shatter any nucleus they come to. They can travel clear across the galaxy. An individual proton or neutron can have the energy of a tennis ball 20 miles an hour, and remember how small those particles are. They smash into the atmosphere, knocking apart atoms willy-nilly, and create carbon-14. Now, carbon-14 is absorbed into plants, just like the more common and stable form, carbon-12. And when the plant dies, no more carbon is being incorporated. The carbon-12 remains stable, but the carbon-14 starts to decay. And as it decays away, we can use the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 as an accurate dating method for any sample that was originally alive. We can use this back for 60,000 years. We will see several examples of this throughout the course. that has a half-life that's that relevant to human history. 
But as we shall see, we can use other stable and unstable isotopes in our reconstruction of the history of everything else, from small paintings to the entire universe.